in this episode, I'm going to be talking about creating encounters in relation to the long-term conflict that I've been developing in the past few episodes. And this process involves an understanding of how the three basic aspects of D&D, combat, role-playing, and exploration, are involved in the process of creating encounters in terms of the mechanics of the game and storytelling. The players find their way to an encounter. Even if they stumble upon something, it's because they're moving through the world. The players activate the NPCs. And this in turn affects how the encounter begins, how it develops as it runs through, and how it ends. At each stage, it is the player's actions and abilities that dictate the details of that encounter. And when you use those actions to unfold and change the storylines that you developed in your campaign, your players and you as the GM will come to a full understanding of why Dungeons & Dragons is the greatest game ever. Hello again, I'm K.R. King and this is my YouTube channel created to help one and all homebrew their own D&D campaign. Now, this is another video in my series on creating a long-term conflict between an NPC and the player characters. If you review some of the early ones, you'll see uh, Kurok, the anointed one, who's this Orkin chieftain uh, who's been harassing this town of Rodenburg in the Barren Hills. And you'll get a sense of the history of the orcs on this continent. And I've broken this series down into segments kind of dictated by the YouTube format, between 10 and 20 minutes on each video. So when you have something as complex as this long-term conflict, in terms of develop the NPCs, their interaction with the world, this village, and then the players' interactions, you know, it can take a few videos to get this going. So I'm going to follow that process in terms of how you think about developing the encounters in terms of the, the way the player characters are going to investigate this situation. And then I'm going to have another video talking about making the encounter maps based upon the player's activities. So we're at the point where the player characters have decided to investigate these night attacks in Rodenburg. They met Issel, the daughter of Jaslyn, who runs the town at Zodi's Tavern, which is the starting point uh, for the campaign in the city of Dramos. Rodenburg is one day's travel from uh, Dramos along the coast, just at the foothills of the Barren Hill. So in my intro, I talked about those three basic aspects of D&D, you know, exploration, combat, and role-playing. And the exploration by the players, their investigation of the situation, is going to determine a lot about what sort of encounter maps uh, and encounters that you're going to have to think up. So I have this example of players I'm playing with online and presented with this situation. What do they do? How do they proceed? Uh, just to review, uh, you have an elven cleric, an elven ranger, you have a half-elf bard, a human wizard, and you have a human paladin. And I talked about creating connections with your player characters' backgrounds and storylines to make it a little more compelling in terms of going to Rodenburg. And in the end, what happened was you had the half-elf bard, Althanor, who has a personal beef with Dulles, the son of the richest guy in Rodenburg. And the paladin, Nolan, has an ex-military background. And Jaslyn, uh, is, who runs the Rodenburg, uh, she is the great-granddaughter of this guy, Morgan, who is a great hero. He founded the military in Dramos. He's kind of the Patton of Dramos. And then the other... Three player characters, they go along for three reasons. One, they can see how important it is to Althanor and especially to Nolan. They also see how much this means to Zodi and his wife Valina in terms of their history. And then there's a metagaming aspect. You know, the GM has put this in front of us, so why not just go for it? So before the players make their way to Rodenburg, you as the GM need to prepare for the encounters. This means making maps. In my previous video, I made kind of a general map you know, five foot squares of the village of Rodenburg. But you're also going to need maps for any encounter that you're not going to run theater of the mind. Now, as my long-term viewers and subscribers know, I am a proponent of using miniatures in almost every battle situation and even in some role-playing situations because they can quickly become who's standing where and what's going on. So I'm always thinking about using, you know, figures on a tabletop or tokens in an online game. And as I always say, don't ever hesitate to use something you find on the internet, let's say a tavern, that you can quickly adapt to a situation that started off as theater of the mind, but you begin to realize, oh, we have to see where everyone is. And then once you've got your maps created, of course, you need, then need to have the adversaries and you need to base those on the abilities of your 
your player characters. So how are the players going to explore and investigate the situation of these night attacks in Rodenburg? Well, once again, I'm going to refer to a video in the past where I talked about constructing your storylines like a detective. You know, sort of thinking backwards, also reverse engineering. Yet another video. Well, the players are going to do this as well. So they've heard that the attacks, they occur at night when there's no moon and they're disguised. And this is very important. They don't yet know anything about Kirok and the orcs or anything like this, just attacks at night. I know as the GM that it's Kirok and the orcs, but Kirok himself doesn't want anyone to know yet that the orcs are massing in the barren hills. He's trying to unite all of the different tribes uh, before this reveal, the thing is the tribes aren't going to unite behind him until they can see that he, you know, scores some victories against the settlers. It's kind of a catch-22 situation. The point is the players don't know this and have to figure it out. So what did Issel tell them at Zodi's Tavern? She was not an eyewitness to any of the attacks. And I decided that I wasn't going to have any of the merchants that she was traveling with be eyewitnesses as well. Now they have learned from Issel that the authorities in Dramos were alerted to these night attacks. They sent some guardsmen there and basically the guardsmen went there they didn't see anything no one attacked they ate a lot of the villagers winter's stores you know sort of irritated them and then left and Issel has also given them a sense of the rivalries you know and suspicions the fact that you know certain uh, farmers and winemakers have been attacked while the richest guy in town Cyrus uh, has been left alone, so there's some suspicions of conspiracies and whatnot. And she has a general idea of this, but they, they're going to find out more when they go to Rodenburg. And these conspiracy theories, they will learn. There's this winemaker, Phineas, who makes incredible wine. Zodi is interested in getting more of this. Cyrus wants to put him out of business. Uh, he's made no secret of that. And Phineas has been one of the people that's being attacked. So how much do the players reveal their interest in the events of Rodenburg in Dramos itself before they leave and then when they get to Rodenburg? Because if they openly snoop around or ask questions, let's say in Dramos, people are going to hear about this. What if there are spies in Dramos that are going to relay this information to whoever's attacking uh, in Rodenburg? It might be people operating out of Dramos for all the players know at this point. And, you know, that's part of the great thing about Kurok's strategy and what I'm doing as a GM is the players aren't sure who's behind it, what's going on. So they have to be so careful about not revealing what they're up to. So, in fact, in this situation, the players decided we're not going to ask any questions in Dramos. We're just going to go to Rodenburg itself. We're going to get this information, you know, on the ground as it were. So for me as a GM, I don't have to worry about are there spies in Dramos? I've talked earlier about possibly having a human who has a connection here. He's got some beef with someone in Rodenborough. He's got some other purpose that it serves to, you know, cooperate with Kirok. I can still do that in the future, but now if the players don't snoop around in Dramos, I don't have to worry about it. So how the players decide to investigate these attacks once they get to Rodenborough will affect the timing and the location of the encounters. And I had originally thought that there would be two tactics the players might employ. The first was just an open investigation. They arrive in Rodenburg, they're looking into these attacks, they interview everyone that they can find uh, to see what's going on. Now, the problem with this strategy is just as in Dramos, they didn't want any spies to find out what they were up to. If they go to Rodenburg and openly start asking questions, if there are spies here or people cooperating with Kirok, they're going to know. And they already saw what happened when city guardsmen were openly there defending the town. The attackers just waited till they left. They could do the same with the players. But there is an advantage to this approach in that they can ask people questions. They can go to someone whose farm or vineyard was attacked. You know, and again, everyone might have a little snippet of information here or there on these attacks. It'll give the players an idea of what's going on and the numbers that they're facing. What did you see? How many were there? What were their tactics? Did they talk to one another? If so, what language were they speaking? Did they run off when confronted or have, have people been killed? And what were the wounds like? This sort of thing. There's all sorts of information that you can get by directly just going around and asking questions, but you're revealing yourself. So the second tactic that I had thought of was that the players arrive in Rodenburg in total secrecy. And in fact, I gave them a little hint here on this. I had Zodi suggest, you know, they could hide in these merchant carts uh, these guys will be sworn to secrecy, or you could even hide out from them. Get to Rodenburg and not reveal yourself. This way, no one knows you're there. You can secret yourself away. And, you know, these kind of hints are dependent on the player's knowledge of the game. I didn't have to do too much hinting here because the players I'm playing with are very knowledgeable of the game and battle tactics. So I had originally thought if the players come in and announce themselves, 
Kurok is going to hold off for a while. They might still find out some information about the attacks, get more from it. And then if they come in secretly, he might just attack as planned, but the players are going to have no information. They're not going to know how many they are, their tactics, you know, what language they speak, etc. In this situation, the players did not take either of the two tactics I thought they were. They decided to use deception. They pretended to be a group of adventurers that are going up into the barren hills to look for, you know, excitement, treasure, whatever. And they just stop off in Rodenburg on the way. It's a day's out. They're going to spend the night there and then move on the next day. So their plan was to uh, spend the evening at the tavern in uh, Rodenburg, get as much information from the locals, you know, very surreptitiously, just ca casually, spend the night. The next day they head out into the hills. They go far enough to get away from any spies or anything that's following them, turn around and come back. And I've set up Phineas as this winemaker that Zodi wants to get more of his wine. He's been under attack. So he'll know that what they're doing and they'll hide out at his vineyard to see if, you know, something happens. So now I have to adapt the storyline and the timing and location of the encounters based on the tactics of the players. How is Kirok going to react, you know, Cyrus and Dulles or any spies in town? You know, what's going to happen here? So now as a GM, I have to adapt the responses of my NPCs to this deception tactic. So first we're going to have some role playing in the tavern where the players are going to ask some just general questions. Oh, what's going on with these attacks without looking too much like they're snooping. So are we just going to have role playing or is there going to be some combat? If there's combat, I'm going to want to have a map of a tavern and I think I'll make one, but I'm probably not going to have any. You know, Dulles has a group of toughs that he hangs out with but it might just be pushing and shoving and the players don't want to kill anybody here. So then the players are going to leave town and go into the barren hills. And in fact, they go 10 miles into the hills in order to make it look like they're really going in case there's a spy or someone that's following them to see what's up. By 10 miles, they're not going to keep following them is their thought. And they're going to turn around and go back. Are they going to have a random encounter? And if so, what's going to happen with this? Uh, would Kirok and his minions, would they see this battle or hear, hear of it going on? Are they going to discover anything if they defeat these creatures, uh, information that might relate to that? So then they return and they stay with Phineas on his vineyard to see if anything happens. And guess what? Oh yes, my friends, Phineas will be attacked. And of course, it's a coincidence, I suppose, but as Dickens said, coincidences are great for storytelling, so we're going to use them. So potentially I'm going to need three maps here. I'm going to need a map of the tavern. Then I'm going to need a map for the random encounter, which I'm thinking you're going to go 10 miles into the barren hills. You're going to run into something, right? And then I'm going to have the battle map of the encounter at Phineas's vineyard. And each of these will be tailored to the player's abilities, you know, their level and whatnot, what they're trying to achieve in terms of killing things or not. And it's going to add to the overall arc of the story, this long-term conflict. So, in my next videos, I'm going to be making these three encounter maps. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. As my long-term commenters know, I love to hear from you. I always reply. And in the meantime, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.